What is going on, GBA fans? My name is Chimpact, and this is the playoff picture. We now know the eight teams that are in the Season 5 GBA playoffs, so let's take a look at the individual coaches and how well they match up with each other. First, we're going to look at the Kanto Conference, and we have the number one seed, Brusha Dawn fans, versus the number four seed, St. Louis Rampardos. El Cizor, coach of the Brusha Dawn fans, and A-Drive, coach of the Rampardos, are in the same division, so they have played two times this season, and they split their games one and one. A-Drive won the first match of the series, while El Cizor took home the second match. However, in the first match of the series, El Cizor had a guaranteed win because there was an opportunity for El Cizor to stack his low HP Poison Dredagon against an Aggron that had recently went for rest. All he needed to do was not click Dragon Tail or not switch out against the Aggron, let it go down, and then go out into his landers to set up a Rock Polish and win the game, barring a freeze from an Ice Punch Uxie due to his landers having a Yachi Berry so it could take any ice hit. But then again, they don't call him Freeze Drive for nothing, so there was a 10% chance for A Drive to possibly win the game. And then the landers also had to not thaw. So in the first series, A Drive won the game, but El Cizer, if he played it 100% correctly, he had the guaranteed win, essentially. But in their second encounter, A Drive started off the game strong with the Salamence getting a first turn knockout against the Crobat. Uh, but the thing is, the game was riddled with DCs, and I believe A Drive is an emotional player, and I think he let that go to his head. And El Cizer played the game despite that really, really well, despite his bad start. He limited the switch-ins for the Salamence, and he eventually forced the Salamence from a drive to go for a Draco Meteor on a Dredagon, which allowed him to set up a Rock Polish sweep, sweep with his Landers. So, in the first game, I believe that Landers should have won the game, and in the second game, the Landers did win the game. So this is a really tough matchup for A-Drive just because of the sheer threat of Rock Polished Landers. Although A-Drive has his own team killer in his Salamence, it can easily be revenge killed and it's much more difficult to set up if it is a Dragon Dance variant due to the Azu that he did bring in Game 1, El Scizor brought Azu, Azumarill in Game 1, and the Sucker Punch Absol that El Scizor has. One thing we haven't seen from A-Drive all season is an all-out offensive team that supports the Sweepers. Through the use of Light Screen and Reflect, he has Smear Goal which can set up the Hazards, he has the Uxie, we can set up the Reflect and Light Screen. Also has the Memento for the Salamence to set up some Dragon Dancers. And he has other set of Pokemon, such as the Heracross as well. So I believe using screens would greatly help him in winning against El Scizor. But I think El Scizor is going to take it unless Adri finds an answer to that Landris. And the other game from the Kanto Conference is the Atlanta Haluchas, coached by Yo Fizz, against the New Orleans Pelippers, coached by Pokemon. Once again, we have division rivals going at it in the playoffs, and once again, they split their games 1-1. One and one. Fizzy won their first game, part due to a misclick or a misplay, I'm not sure what it was from Pokemon, but he didn't click head smash against an obvious Charizard Y switch in. He dedicated that move slot on his Dawn fan to hit the Charizard Y, and he didn't click it. He clicked Earthquake as soon as he got it, he really wanted to cancel it, but this is Wi-Fi, this isn't Showdown, you're not able to cancel. And he allowed the Charizard Y to come in unharmed, and Fizzy just rode the momentum, he got a kill with the Charizard. And in the late game, he was able to just win with Statland and Sand because of the momentum that the Charizard Y provided him. In their next game, it really looked like Fizzy didn't want to win. He brought Agility Venomoth as opposed to Quiver Dance, Baton Pass, which is allowed in the GPA. I understand where he was coming from because Agility works well with the uh, Tyranitar that he has, which is Dragon Dance, so he doesn't need to Dragon Dance too many times. And he also has the Belly Drum Chestnut, which provides the speed because he has a citrus berry instead of a salic berry which belly drum chestnut usually runs but the chestnut actually had a chance to win against the raiko because the raiko it could have been it could have lived a specs raiko's hidden power ice i believe uh because he took an extra sensory and was at over 50 percent so he's able to take an extra sensory and belly drum damage with the citrus berry and uh, would have been able to sweep the rest of his team but i guess he didn't want to risk him being expert belt extra sensory or Maybe it was a low roll or something like that, but or even specs, of course. But uh, he he didn't make that play, and he eventually just he didn't have enough offense on the team. He pretty much only had Belly Drum Chestnut, Dragon Dance Tyranitar, which isn't really that reliable, and Stoutland, which isn't reliable when you're using Dragon Dance Tyranitar because it's either Tyranitar that's gonna die, and you don't have a lot of sand turns left with Stoutland, or Titar just doesn't do enough and Stalin has to do too much work. So he really didn't bring a lot of offense and he got punished for it. So in this matchup, I think it's going to be decided on how Fizzy deals with that Raikou. Because he only really has three Pokemon to deal with it because I don't think that he Fizzy is going to bring Helio Heliolisk into the, 
into a Raikou, even if he brings it into the battle. He has Tyranitar, Garchomp, and Chestnut, which are the only Pokemon that can take a Thunderbolt and reliably damage the Raikou back. But the thing about it is Garchomp and Chestnut have to worry about being hit super effectively by Hidden Power Ice, and the Chestnut has to worry about Extra Sensory, which deals even more damage. But uh, I think Fizzy can definitely take this win by putting pressure on Pokemon's defensive Pokemon with Garchomp, so that he solvents them up for a Statland Sweep, which is how he won the first game, so... It'll be interesting to see how this game goes, but I got a... Uh, I think, I think Pokemon will win this one. So, in the other conference, the Johto Conference, we've got the number one seeded Real Murillo, coached by Mega Mogwai. Going up against the Dark Horse team of the playoffs, the number four seeded Cincinnati Loudreds, coached by Mulvone. The series was split one-on-one -on -one between the two teams, but they didn't actually play a second time as Mogwai forfeited. I believe he was already clinched a playoff spot, so he didn't really need to play. And... The thing about Mulvone is that he is on a four game winning streak. So the only person that has a better winning streak going into the playoffs is the number one seed overall in the playoffs, which is the Borussia Dawn fans. So Mulvone definitely has a lot of momentum going on for him. And Mogwai, I don't think he's played a lot of games near the end of the season. So in the first game that uh, they played, the first and only game, Mogwai made a very aggressive play by grass nodding a Weavile as Gastron switched in which ultimately won him the game because he knocked out the Gastrodon so that his Scarf Greninja with Surf was able to sweep the rest of Movone's team. And in their first encounter, Movone was unable to get up any hazards and was pressured by Mogwai's aggressive plays from the start. So in their rematch, I'd like to see Movone put priority on setting up hazards. I really think Movone's offensive Pokemon are the best in the league by far, and having an offensive battle with Mogwai may be the best bet that he has to win against him. So something like a Custat Berry Fortress lead with Stealth Rock and Spikes might be what he needs to get the edge in that type of battle. And the last matchup of the playoffs is going to be between the Boston Red Sox, coached by Superblah, and the San Francisco Arcaniners, coached by Septile MC. This matchup is the only non-divisional matchup in the playoffs this round, so they only played once before. In that game, Superblah prepared pretty well, but there were some inconsistencies in his team building. He didn't put out a team building video, so I'm not sure of what all of his sets were. But not having Sucker Punch on his Nidoking cost him the game, I think. Because had he knocked out the Godstyle, he would have still had his Nidoking, of course. But having the Nidoking alive would have been amazing for him because it was another threat for him to deal with, first of all. Second of all, its ground and poison typing are too invaluable for his team because the ground typing forces the Rotom to not click Volt Switch as freely as it wants to. And the poison typing enables the Nidoqueen to not set up Tog Spikes because the Nidoqueen can easily just absorb the Tog Spikes. The Shed Shell on Skarmory was a great decision on Super Bowl's part. I really like that. But I think putting Shed Shell on his Cresselia as well would have been great as well because it's a better answer to Low Pony than Skarmory. And the Cresselia can get PP stalled by the combination of Trick and Rest. So losing Cresselia for essentially nothing when it's your best Low Pony switch in would be pretty miserable. But in the battle itself, Superblot did appear to get a bit unlucky, missing a Fire Blast on Nidoqueen, which would have put in Sneasel's knockoff range. And immediately after, he proceeded to miss an Icicle Crash on that same Nidoqueen, which cost him his Sneasel. So after that good fortune that was provided to him, Sceptile didn't allow Blah to gain any sort of momentum and won by just Volt turning around. The battle did DC, but they both agreed that with Volt Switch and U-Turn, uh, Septile MC would have just won the game. So both of these players prepare very well for their opponents. So it'll be interesting to see of how each player is going to prepare for certain things. How they're going to counter their counters and counter that counter. So something like Encore and Low Pony would be interesting to deal with a defensive Manaphy. That has like Calm Mind, Rest, Rain Dance or something like that. But I think Superblah has too many big threats in Manaphy, Needle King, Sneasel, Metagross, Tyrantrum. And his defensive core is too solid um, between Skarm and Crest for Sceptile to deal with. So the longer the game lasts, the better it gets for Superblah. So I think Sceptile MC has to bring Crawdon and his other offensive Pokemon to make the game go as fast as it can. Otherwise, he has to hope he gets as lucky as he did in the first game to be able to pull out a win. So I think in the playoffs, Superblah is going to get the W against Sceptile MC. And that's going to be it for the playoff picture. Let me know who you guys have winning. And I'll see you guys next week for the conference championships. Peace.